Joining us now is Congressman Jamie Raskin, uh, Democrat of Maryland, the author of the new book, Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. Congressman, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Rachel. So I have to ask you, um, reading the book and knowing you a little bit and having talked to you over the course of the last few years, I, you are incredibly articulate, unimaginably articulate about your choice to stay public, to keep working, and indeed to write this book in the midst of this grief and this challenge. Now that you are putting it out to the world and able to talk about it, does it still feel like the right thing to do? Does it still feel like you had to do it? Well, Tommy was a young man, indeed he was a boy who was filled with extraordinary moral and political passions. And um, I think it feels right because of who he was and what he wanted for the world. Uh, Tommy was in his second year at Harvard Law School uh, when we lost him, and he was deeply engaged in movements for human rights, against war, for animal rights and welfare. Uh, and to defend and expand democracy. He was asking a lot more of democracy, not less. And so I did feel him very much in my heart and in my chest through that entire period. And um, it's been a tough year, Rachel, as you know, and I wasn't getting a lot of sleep for a long time. And I was up at nighttime, and there were very few people left to call, even on the West Coast when I was up so late. And um, I decided that I could either spend the rest of my life obsessed with this 50-day period in my life where I could try to record it for my daughters, for my family, for my constituents, for my friends, for my fellow countrymen and women. Um, and I would do that um, and try to make some sense of what had happened. A year on um, now, how do you think Tommy would feel about the work that's happened in the country in response to the attack, in the effort to try to investigate what happened, in the effort to pursue accountability. Obviously, the first step to pursue accountability was the effort that you led, the impeachment. Um, but you're a member of the January 6th investigation now. We've learned so much more since. There's still so many open questions about what happened and how it will be, um, how it will be accounted for. How do you think he would view our progress over the year? Well, when Tommy was not under the darkness of his depression, uh, he was the life of the party, and he was radically optimistic uh, and buoyant about our prospects for changing things um, in America and all over the world. And I think uh, he'd be looking on the bright side of uh, how many people are cooperating with our investigation, how many people are coming forward to tell the truth about what happened and how many people really want to solidify the institutions of American democracy. There's no doubt that as we get closer to Donald Trump, there's a coterie of people like Steve Bannon and Mark Meadows uh, who are very much protecting uh, the secrets of what took place. But I think uh, that truth will prevail. And I think that Tommy had confidence that um, in democracy, you're not going to be able to fool uh, all of the people all of the time. The truth is going to resurface. You're hard on yourself um, throughout the book, um, both in terms of seeing the signs of what was going on with your son, also in terms of seeing the signs of what was going on with the country and with the democracy. You, you write in detail about how um, Speaker Pelosi in the, in the spring of 2020 had asked you and some of your colleagues to basically game out all of the ways that the election could be messed with, um, the ways that Trump and his cohort might try to corrupt the election result or try to uh, try to steal it. And you describe all the different scenarios that you prepared for. But then you say this, you say, in essence, we had predicted every maneuver coming our way except for one, the unleashing of mob violence to intimidate the vice president in Congress, overwhelm and stop the counting of votes and provide a pretext and context for Trump to potentially intervene with military force under the Insurrection Act to put down the uprising he himself had helped to organize. Obviously, hindsight is, is twenty twenty here, but I'm I'm wondering if if you had the thing you beat yourself up for is not having seen that coming. Had you seen that coming? Had you been able to predict that as a potential outcome? Is there something that could have been done proactively to to stop it from happening? 
Well, we just spent countless hours figuring out every possible parliamentary maneuver and countermaneuver if Vice President Pence, in fact, decided to declare these extra constitutional lawless powers to reject and rebuff electoral college votes, uh, if the GOP pursued their objections to particular states or staged a walkout. We had tried to predict every possible parliamentary maneuver. But, of course, uh, being Democrats and being liberal-minded people, we were thinking completely within the context of uh, the constitutional and legal system. And that's why I quote some of uh, the right wing's favorite philosophers, uh, like Carl Schmidt, who said that sovereign is he who controls the exception. And on January 6th, we moved out of the rule of law and into this twilight land of the exception, where they were talking about invoking the Insurrection Act. They were making things up about the Electoral Count Act, making things up about the Constitution. And that we had not prepared for, and that I indeed fault myself for. Um, just like I say, I fault myself for not talking about suicide uh, to Tommy, and I liken not talking to a depressed person about suicide to not talking to a teenager about sex. You think somehow you're being clever and you're suppressing a reality that you don't want to materialize, but uh, in fact, you're making it worse because when you don't speak these words, it endows them with more power. And I likened not talking about suicide to not talking about fascism. And I think we have to talk about fascism, which Madeleine Albright has reminded us is not a specific ideological system with particular content. It's just a strategy for taking power and maintaining power against the rule of law and against the majority in a democracy. And it's something that doesn't happen all at once. It's something that starts, as you describe, and as Madeleine Albright has observed, it starts uh, in places you might not expect and creeps. And if you ignore, ignore it while it's starting, um, it, only, it only grows.